Last week marks a world of fast fashion and sophisticated budget supermarkets, the one-time favorite of the British middle classes is on the slide. Really what is remarkable about Marx? One of its biggest sellers, the prawn sandwich, tells us everything about what it has represented and drawn us in with for so many decades. Four, bundled up in those slices of bread, is a message of convenience, modernity and aspiration. It's long been about those things that have made our lives easier, but also made us feel that little bit posher. The story of that sandwich, as well as many other technological innovations, is told in this, Our Guide to Marx. Pennies well spent when Michael Marx first set up the Penny Bazaar that was the precursor to Marx. Don't ask the price, it's a penny, its slogan went. What it sold at the time wasn't so much clothes as haberdashery, since most working class people then made their own clothes. 1920s The Marx Yes, she said breathlessly. Who doesn't? That quote from Thatcher, who was at the time one of the store's biggest promoters, sums up the long-running relationship there has been between the British public and the Marx. It's a relationship that began in 1926, at a time when fleecy knickers were among their biggest sellers, when Marx. By 1953 M. It also introduced cup sizes, and by the 1970s staff were measuring customers' bra sizes 1940s utility clothing marks. But that didn't mean the clothes were dull and drab, the opposite. As Katie Cameron, marks. As a result, you actually see a lot of colorful printed garments. There was a vast array, therefore, of dazzling patterns from cowboys and ballerinas to Egyptian-inspired motifs. 1950 South The Princess Street Store On June 12, 1957, the Edinburgh Princess Street Store opened its doors for the very first time. The crowd of shoppers that turned up that morning was so huge that police were forced to split the queue into three parts before opening the door. According to sales records, 17 dozen summer dresses, 16 dozen blouses, 15 dozen children's dresses, and 10 dozen nylon slips were sold in the first hour. The store is still the busiest in Scotland. 1960s fabric technology Those hair-raising, static-generating men-made fibers that were a feature of the 1960s and 1970s were often pioneered by Marx. In fact, Simon Marx, who was the company chairman in the 1950s, said it was his mission to make the housewife's life easier, making clothes that were much simpler to wear and wash. Kirtle, an acrylic, wool-like fiber, was first launched in the UK by Marx. These fabrics were often drip-dry, easy iron and held their color or shape. They helped liberate women from domestic chores, while at the same time making marks. Fabulously beautiful, wonderful Terraline, made the St. Michael Way, runs the jingle on a 1960s advert in which dancers, dressed in slacks, and skirts that have pleats that are, made to stay, perform a routine that looks straight out of a Hollywood musical. Fashionable, washable, it added, and always looks like new. Similar adverts exist extolling the virtues of acrylon and Brie Nylon. St. Michael's clothes and Brie Nylon are the dreams you can pack and take with you, says a voiceover, as the film leaps between sunny Mediterranean locations. The new fabrics were aspirational, pitched as part of a life dream life that involved travel, glamour and smart cars. Free nylon stretch swimsuits, the voice goes on, that keep their shape and yours in perfect trim. Styles as new as swimming in space. The chilled chicken marks. The 
chilled, rather than frozen, chicken was born. 1970s sell-by dates a revolution so crucial that when marks It's now hard to remember a life before the sell-by date, when people used to have to sniff a food, or take a guess as to whether a food was fresh and safe or not and anything that needed to be kept was frozen or tinned. Then the concept was created in the storerooms of Marks. The sell-by date remains one of the most significant labelings of food, and the one that makes our entire food system possible. The Chicken Kiev In 1979 the Chicken Kiev arrived and changed our food landscape forever. Almost impossible to make at home and irresistibly flavorsome, it was so popular it required a dedicated new factory. The TV dinner had been born and aspirational convenience food was on its way. I remember very well thinking it was rather posh the food writer Rose Prince recently recalled in an article in The Independent. It seemed like something exotic and quite bistro, behind this revolution was a chef called John Docker, who had given marks. The ball had started rolling. Come the 21st century what started with the Kiev would become a massive multi-billion pound industry. Currently half of the ready meals in Europe are sold in Britain. 1980s The packaged sarnu back in the 1980s just about the poshest snack you could get was the M. In fact, the sandwich chiller it marks. If one thing changed our lives more than anything else, it was the supermarket's invention, in 1980 of the packaged sandwich, or, sandwich, as it has been called. The innovation came, almost by accident, when a few unsold sandwiches from the cafe and the Marble Arch store were packaged up and sold, but soon it was being rolled out throughout the country. The Edinburgh Prince's Street store was one of the first to trial it, with staff constructing sandwiches in a stockroom. Since then we've turned into a packaged sandwich nation, eating 3.5 billion pounds worth of the things a year. The Thatcher Years Margaret Thatcher and Marks I do go to Marks. They're marvelous. Their cut is excellent and they've now got all kinds of colors. But the connection was about more than taste, or supporting British retail. Lord Seif, the last of the actual Marks. Seif also backed the conservative philosophy group. 1990s DM In one of author Helen Fielding's columns, Bridget describes her friends coming round with M. The column was a sharp portrait of casual entertaining and aspirational 1990s Britain. Peak sparkle this was the decade when marks Back in the early 1990s it was even cool to wear marks. The rise and fall of Marks and Spencer cites Vicky Woods, the former editor of Harper's. They were, rootling through every garment in the store, looking for the M. This is a melt-in-the-middle Belgian chocolate pudding served with Channel Island cream, drew old Derv Le Kerwan in a voiceover so sultry that it felt like it belonged on some 1970s soft-focus porn. Nigella Lawson had already made this kind of sexy delivery her trademark, but Marks. The advert sent the chocolate pudding sales soaring. This wasn't just food porn, it was an M. Was it that clothes weren't right? Was it that Next seemed to have seized grip on the clothing market in the UK? Was it that there was a new breed of supermarkets emerging on the British high streets? Was it that using British suppliers, rather than goods imported from low-cost countries like their competitors, was too much of a burden? Probably it was all of these things, and many more. The store switched to overseas suppliers. 
it dropped its iconic St. Michael brand, and replaced it with 13 others. But the slide kept happening. Then, the financial crash came in 2008, hitting marks. 2010's The Miracle Skirt in 2015 The Marks The skirt, for those who don't remember it, was mid-length, suede and brown, and probably would have gone unnoticed if it were not for the fact that style guru Alexa Chung was photographed wearing it. But Chung and the publicity around the skirt performed a miracle and in May, when it went on sale, it quickly sold out. However, some were not convinced. The Guardian's Hadley Freeman claimed the skirt represented a triumph of M. Stuck in the middle the last eight years have only brought relentless bad news stories from the supermarket, the latest of which has been that they are to close 100 stores by 2022. There are many reasons behind this, one of them being that other companies are doing aspirational food very well. In 2014, sales at John Lewis and Waitrose overtook those at Marks. One idea that is often cited as part of the problem is that Marks. People are going to them just for occasional treats, while exploiting the bargain deals for other products at Lidl and Aldi, or fast fashion chains like Zara and H. M. It emerged from the middle of the country, as a Jewish peddler traveled the cities of England selling his wares. It priced itself in the middle. It offered a middle level of quality above the traditional fare but below high-end, exclusive products. It even established its sales associates as somehow between the standard shop girls that populated stores in the mid-20th century and the snooty salespeople of the high-end department stores. The middle is no place to be anymore.